Good afternoon, uh, or good morning, probably still good to see you all. Um, so, December last year, I was 40 years from when I joined IBM um, as a trainee recruit out of uh, university. And back then, the kind of mainframe ruled the world and IBM was, in a sense, the Google of the uh, information technology industry. And over 40 years, um, I've been consumed, interested, disillusioned, surprised by the various waves of change that technology has enabled. Uh, some obviously came to fruition, um, others not so great. Um, the paperless office was promised back in the 1980s and we, we're still waiting a bit for that. The um, evolution then of mini computers that brought general purpose computing to a lot more enterprises than just the very large ones that could afford mainframes. And then from where we went to PC, client server, internet, social media, you, you, you know, the whole, the whole explosion, which uh, the last 20 years certainly was covered very well in the previous uh, talk by Jeremiah. The, the, thing, the thing about all of that is that when I look back over 40 years, there's one thing that I genuinely believe that I have learnt that I continue to be a little bit um, annoyed, frustrated about, is that there's one thing that matters more and more and more, the more the technology touches our lives, and that is the human element. And I specifically call it the human element because it's every aspect of what makes your organisation what it is that is human. And when you think about it that way, you realise the human element touches everything. When we talk about culture, and I'm going to touch on it, we tend to narrow the human element to a set of behaviours and values. And what I want to talk about today is that you should see the human element in every aspect of your organisation, from its purpose through to what happens every day, and you need to cultivate that in a way that is far more deliberate, far more obsessive than what you are doing today. And I say that because I know that even today, I should be sport, spending more time on the human element of the development of Xero, um, because it is the difference maker, and what I hope to leave with you today is that. Just a few contextual points. As far as I know, technology is not yet innovating. It's getting close, sir, but it's people who innovate. It's people who innovate. You know, that's, that's a critical thing. What technology has done is amplify the potential of people. I love Jeremiah's presentation, but I would never compare users today to serfs. We see it every day in the activation of humans around a cause, around a belief that can make the most powerful institutions think about the way they do things. But technology's amplified our potential. Your potential, everyone's potential works with you, is amplified. Why? Very simply, functions of your potential are what you know, your knowledge, and who you're connected with. And in both those cases, and I won't go into too much detail because I've got time today, but if I look at my journey, my access to knowledge, my connection with others is magnitudes what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. So our potential is amplified. What we have to do is be obsessive about making sure we capture that, that we enable that within our organisations. And with that will come innovation. With that will come great digital organisation. So I want to get behind the six points there were the what. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the how. The other aspect of this potential is we're seeing unprecedented rates of change. We've talked about that a lot. Change is faster and faster. That's because humans are initiating change at a faster rate. And it's really important to sort of reflect on that in that, you know, organisations on this planet do not change. They don't. It's their people who change. So organisational change is about changing individuals, it's about changing people, connecting with people. So it's really, really important that we appreciate that if we are leaders of change, and I know many of you here are, you see a better future than the present, you want to create it, you've got to be really, really good at change. If you want to be really, really good at change, you have to be obsessive about the human element of your organisation because you're trying to change people, both those within your organisation, those that you rely on external to your organisation. The final thing I want to touch on as a context setter for why I um, think the way I think and do what I'm going to show you I do is mindsets. 
So when I look over the 40 years of how the technology industry has evolved, success has been defined by the mindset of the leaders of organisations. Digital equipment dominated the mini computer era. Ken Olsen, great, great leader in the tech industry. Ken Olsen was the same guy who said, I can't see why anyone would need a computer in their home. You know, the, Microsoft, phenomenal company, you know, very much, um, in a sense, a mindset around Windows, 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 to the point where they did dumb things like rebranding Hotmail, which was the most popular consumer free email service in the world. They renamed it Windows Live Mail and then had to change to Windows Live Hotmail because of the reaction from people saying, what are you doing to our Hotmail brand? So it's things like that. It's the mindset of leaders that then generate the mindset of those around them that generate the fate. So your future is in your mind. It's the way you think, what you believe, and uh, how you go about it that is going to um, define whether or not you achieve what you want to achieve or not. So I want to make, in a sense, you more conscious in your mindset about what it really means, what it really means to... Um, to do this, which is demonstrate the human element matters most to you. Um, I'm going to give you a, a talk about where to from here in the context of zero. And I thought it was, um, was worthwhile to um, reflect on my zero journey just briefly. Um, this is Rod Drury, the founder of Zero, and me. This is about two years ago when I became CEO and Rod became uh, one of our directors and still stays very much engaged and uh, is always there when I need him. Um, he looks 10 years younger now, and I look 10 years older. So that's um, one of the things that we reflect on uh, a little bit. But um, I first met Rod uh, 10 years ago through, a, a, it was actually an email through someone that was a mutual friend. Uh, he was looking for someone to run his Australian business when Zero was just starting up in Australia, uh, had moving off from New Zealand um, to Australia and internationally. And um, I was able to, you know, I was sort of in between things at the time, so I decided to do a bit of a, a recruitment uh, job for him, gave him two candidates, recommended one, he hired the guy and sent me six bottles of wine and uh, realised then that um, if I was going to make a career in recruitment, I had to get my, um, my charging mechanism a little bit more uh, effective. But um, so Chris Ridd was joined, joined Zero and was a very successful leader and grew Zero's business in Australia and that was a very important step in the journey. But then a few years ago, uh, I connected with uh, a couple of the executives that Rod, Rod was working with, and then ultimately Rod himself. And Rod and I sat down, we had a cup of coffee. This is, by the way, three and a half years ago, I've been CEO for two years. So it was 18 months before I became CEO. And, and Rod said, you know, look, I'm not a great coach. Um, you know, I see the future. I've got a vision for what zero should and can be, but there's a lot we're going to have to do here to grow and scale internationally. So he asked me to help him, and I did. For 18 months, it was probably for Rod and for Zero, in a sense, a pretty long job interview um, because they really got to know me, I got to know them. And um, I was able to, in the way that Rod allowed me, really start to activate the things that I believe the company needed to do if it was going to scale. Things like really refining strategy in the context of the presentation yesterday, the five choices, um, all the way through to how that touches your operating plans and budgets. Uh, product business management is an area we can talk about if you want to, but that's a massive challenge for organisations as they scale, which is how do you keep the products you're building most relevant to the customers you're serving and at the same time make sure they commercially return um, what it is you aspire for them to, uh, to, to, to count for your business. Uh, and then finally, the global operating model. It's a big difference being a global technology business um, and operating in multiple countries with multiple products than it is to be a single country, uh, single product uh, business. So um, why I joined Zero though, was for a bunch of reasons, a bunch of things I loved about Zero. The first was, it's awesome after spending my career with US tech companies, um, to, have, to be able to work with a global technology business that comes from New Zealand, comes from our part of the world. So that was special, that was rare, that was really, really something that I uh, appreciated and also respected enormously. The second was we had a product and customers and partners, uh, the product is loved by our customers and partners. I mean, we have this conference every year called ZeroCon. It's 
crazy, just the love that our customers um, and our partners have for, for the business. Um, the values of zero. For me, zero is home. And what I mean by that is um, it's very rare that you can actually, as a CEO, join a company that has the culture you aspire to create. And we have that. The foundation of our culture is something we call hashtag human. It's that zeros are authentic. You're your real self, yourself at work in every context. No pretense, no masks. We're inclusive and we really care. That's, that's the foundation and it lives and breathes in everything that we do uh, and it's reinforced by the way um, our stakeholders feel about us. But really what I loved as well was our purpose. You know, having been in the tech industry for a long time, small business has generally been a neglected sector. And it is the last frontier of where small business people who are operating their own companies have an opportunity to really take advantage of technology in a way they haven't previously. And so we're part of that movement and we're really excited about that. So our purpose is to make life better for people in small business, their advisors and communities around the world. We say communities around the world um, very genuinely because small business is family and small business is community. And small business is actually increasingly the, the, the home of innovation in many, many economies. So helping small business succeed is a purpose we're really signed up to and, and it's reinforced. Like we don't, it's not something we just make up and hope for. I was at a, um, a function in Wellington recently and I met uh, a married couple who are obviously in business and the fellow asked me, what do you do for a living? I said, I work for Zero. He looked at me, he goes, Zero saved our marriage. And, and I, I kind of laughed and I looked at his wife and she looks at me and goes, he's serious. Zero saved our marriage. And then accountants and bookkeepers around the world all say, wow, we, what we do and how we do it, we couldn't have done it without zero. So, so that is something that we're very convicted about and really is something all our people relate tremendously to. Um, zero today, just to give you a little bit of an idea, over 2,000 subscribers, uh, revenue on its way to big numbers, uh, offices around uh, in 20, 20 cities. We've got Zero being used in a whole bunch of countries around the world uh, and we have 3,000 employees. We're growing fast and we have a very, very ambitious view of our future. Um, we see the opportunity both in terms of the number of small businesses that are out there that we could serve and the range of services that we could provide them as significantly greater than where we are today. We still believe we are in the early stages of uh, capitalising on that opportunity. We'll have to do different things and evolve our strategy to be able to meet all those needs in different places around the world, but the opportunity is there. If you said to me, what is our vision, sort of 2030 is the time frame that we, we envisage as we dip, build our strategy for the next three years. To me, what I'd love to see Zero become is the advisor in the cloud. Someone that can help a small business with simple things like, what do I need to do today? You know, what are the issues? What could I do better today? Because coaching is evident in virtually every aspect of human performance, except it's lacking in small business. We see our accounts and bookkeepers, many of them being logical people who can evolve into being those advisors as well. And the reason why we hold them dear to our hearts is that my view is a small business person, even in the face of getting a message that says, hey, you better call customer X because they haven't placed an order in the last month, isn't likely to act on that unless they're encouraged by someone who cares about them and gives them feedback and holds them accountable to doing the things they need to do. So um, we've got a very ambitious view of the future and certainly the six principles in the previous slide that Jeremiah showed um, are really resonated very strongly with me in terms of the what we need to be doing. So let's move on then to how I take this human element and work it every day in the way that I look at Zero, the leadership team and how we engage with our people. First of all, I wanted to find something for you, which is what do I mean by the human element? The human element is this, it's the mindsets and emotions that shape why people do what they do and how they do it. So your why, your purpose, your how, how you go about doing it and what you do every day defines the human element is defined by the human element. This is where I think culture as a concept is, is limiting. For example, if we're in the business of helping people in whatever way, that's our purpose. We want us to change something for the better. 
And then we decide, um, no, we're going to change our purpose. Now we're going to go and make money. Making money is now our, our top priority. There's a very strong chance that many of your people will say, you know what? That's not for me. See you later. And then when you look at your priorities in your strategy, when you start to prioritise and get clear about what you've got to get done, you're going to realise that some of the people aren't going to want to do those things, aren't the right people to do those things. So you cannot separate the human element from purpose, strategy, and everything that happens every day. And that's why I see it very much as mindsets and emotions, because it's about the humanity that stands behind why you do what you do, how you do what you do, and what you do every day. For this reason, every organisation has multiple cultures. And every organisation is different from others because the why, the how, and the what is different. There are no two organisations or even two functions within a company that have exactly the same why, how, what. And so trying to build a culture based on some aspiration of what it should look like is challenging because it's going to vary. Even within your, your sales culture is going to be different to your product development culture. And so it should be. They do different work. So what I want to talk about is my mind lens on this is how do I make sure that I'm creating the best culture or environment, the best mindsets and emotional state of our people by focusing on a few things that really matter? And those things I almost articulate as, if you tackle these things, you knock off the things that create bad culture. Bad culture is created by consistent themes. And so what I'm going to show you are a few things that I think are fundamental. The first one, make it safe to speak the truth. But the real word there is make it safe. Make it safe. Make it safe. Make it safe for your people to challenge. Make it safe for your people to try things and fail. Make it safe for people to tell you as CEO, you don't know what you're doing. Now, I had that call recently. <laughs> One of my directs rings me up and says, what are you on, man? Like, seriously? You know, what, what are you thinking? And you have to have that. And there was a great, great presentation yesterday afternoon on from ProMap, where in their way, they created a safe work environment to people, for people to challenge, to change. But it's critical. Um, this is, if you're only going to do one thing, seriously, one thing to build a good culture, just make it safe. So things to do there in terms of what I do, I ask people to tell me what they think of what I'm doing, what I've said, and how I'm going. And I won't rest until they've actually told me and answered the question. The idea, of how, do we, how is that? If you are the boss or you are you know, sort of senior in a hierarchy, that, that brings fear. You know, fear is, fear is one of those elements of change that is, makes it hard for us to change but it's an important human element. I mean, you know, being fearful can be functionally really important. That's why we're all here today. We probably feared doing something that could have got us into trouble. But what you have to realise is that fear rules. Fear of the hierarchy, fear of making mistakes, fear of failure, fear of hurting feelings. Those fears are obstacles to change and evolution. They are obstacles to having the best culture you can possibly have. So this one is really important, and as I said, seek feedback, but really anything that you do to add to the fear in your organisation is destructive. You should actually consciously be looking at situations where you think there is fear. For instance, I had a Slack message from one of our developers saying, started with, this could be a career limiting message, right? So I saw her, I asked to see her and said, listen, it's never career limiting around here. You could get promoted for challenging me, challenging the way things are done. We need that. So that's a really critical thing. Um, we've always got work to do because fear can arise in different circumstances, but make sure that the foundation of building a great culture, whether it's digital, building a great team, by the way, this, this formula is good for great teamwork, great culture, just about great everything. Just get, make sure you're focused on making it safe. The second is make the tough decisions and the tough choices. It's always a lot easier to say a little bit of yes to everybody than yes to the things that really matter. When you say no to doing things, it's tough because you're saying no to good people with good ideas. They're the hard ones. The choice between good and bad is easy. Anyone can make it. The choice between bad and badder, bad if we don't do this, or bad, you know, sorry, bad, bad if we don't do this, but it could be badder if we do do it because it takes focus and resources away. I, I put the photo of Steve Jobs there because 
I was there when he came back to Apple. Um, I was running the Asia Pacific region and the, in my view, the most significant thing Steve Jobs did to turn Apple around was to cut 75% of the product line. And there was a product called the Newton, it was a handheld PDA that he disliked intensely because it had a pen. Um, and we all know that he didn't think the PDA should have pens. Um, he uh, decided to kill that product. We had 2,000 developers around the world building applications on that platform. And I sent him an email saying, Steve, I feel really uncomfortable about this, we're gonna get a lot of pushback. And he just sent an email back saying, we must save the Mac, we must save the Mac. That was the times um, that we were in, which was the company was in trouble and doing less was fundamental to success. But saying no to good ideas is, a fun is, is actually a sign that you are focused, that you're not going into too many different areas. And that's really tough. It's really tough for me today. It's really tough for anybody who's confronted with that challenge. Um, the next one is really important. Constantly seek clarity. At the end of the day, being clear about purpose and having a strategy which tells you what's important is about clarity. Now, clarity doesn't always exist, particularly if you're in startup world, you're seeking it. But the point here is, not necessarily to say you've got to be clear, you've got to be always thinking about and looking to get clear. This came home to me in a really, really graphic way when I was CEO of 9MSN. 9MSN, for those of you who might remember, it was a joint venture between Microsoft and uh, PBL, biggest media company um, in Australia at the time. It was the beginning of the dot-com online advertising world. And there was no online ad market when we, when we created the company. The company had $100 million of capital invested. It had smart people, all the tech you could get in the world. So it was a weird startup. Um, after about a year, we were producing rubbish, to put it bluntly. We weren't really producing much good stuff, even though we had lots of people innovating. We had eight different teams creating websites, building their own things, some in news, some in finance, some in travel. They were all doing their thing. And so, and the work environment was amazing back then. This is, you know, around the year 2000. It was, you know, a very cool, funky work environment. And, but, but we weren't, it just didn't feel right. So I got everyone in a room and I could because we had less than 100 people. And I said, how do you rate how satisfied you are working here? What's your score out of 10? And remember, I've, I've worked for many years now. I've been much older than everyone I work with. And so I, I certainly appreciated how spoilt these people were working where they were and doing what they were doing. Anyway, the score was five out of 10, five out of 10. And I, I was quite, in a way, surprised, you know, that, wow, you know, with this wonderful innovative environment, we we're all creating and, you know, wearing black and kind of um, having drinks every Friday. How could you possibly say five out of 10? And it came down to one thing, which was really obvious. They said, we don't know why we're here and we don't know, therefore, how what we're doing fits with why we're here. And by the way, we're doing so many things against other competitors, we don't even know whether we can win at doing what we're doing. So over the next 12 months, we did only one thing. We got clear about purpose, clear about priorities. We cut eight things down to three. And that was tough because of people involved in all those changes that you know, we had to bring on the journey and sometimes have the hard conversation if it required it, but we did that, we did that very sensitively and, and in a very human way. Um, and then a year later, we had the same meeting and asked the same question, and the score was eight out of 10. So it was a case where the only thing that changed in an organization was clarity of purpose and clarity of alignment of our people with that purpose in terms of what they were doing. So for me, I'm nuts about always asking a question, are we clear? What are we unclear about? How do we get clearer? You know, what's happened around us that's changed? And that leads me to the next one, is once you're clear or have a view, then making it line up is fundamental. And this is a big gap. I was taught strategy, how to develop one, the five questions. I was taught how to give people job objectives and manage people, but I wasn't taught alignment. And in a strategy conversation when you, you know, yesterday we were talking about going from right to left, I actually believe strategy is what you do today to create the future you desire. I don't see, I don't think you can separate the importance of your actions today from your aspirations in the future. You can answer those five questions, but what did you do today 
that lined up with that. So I'm completely nuts about lining it up, alignment, alignment, alignment. And most CEOs, most organizations do not do a good job of alignment. What does that mean? I want every zero to understand how their work connects in the most meaningful way with our purpose, our big picture, and where we want to go. Because the truth is, they are better at changing their roles to suit what we want than I am. If I give them that big picture and I show them the connection, they can say, hang on a minute, why is doing that the most important thing? And by the way, when you cascade your strategy into action, you also highlight the things that are trade-offs. To do the strategy and execute it, we need more resources. We're going to have to take them from somewhere else. Or we might go back and say, you know what, we can't do that this year. But you don't lose it, you just delay it. But unless you're having real conversations at every layer of your organisation about what's expected and what resources it takes to do it and how aligned those people are, you are not going to execute your strategy effectively. So to me, alignment, alignment, make it line up, should be, you know, there's, I think as a CEO, you probably don't have time for much more than just that. Making sure everyone in your organisation is lined up in the most effective way with where you want to go in the future. And it's a, it's a missing discipline. S some organisations are good at it. Don't get me wrong, there are that are good at it and very deliberate about it. Um, certainly the US tech companies I worked with were very good at it. Um, but more broadly, I don't, I don't think enough of us spend enough time on that. And then finally, do it, review it and adapt it. In other words, certainly in startup land, but even for us, we, we have a view of our strategy and where we want to go, but that's going to be adapt, we're going to, our actions and experiences will be informed, will inform what we do. Um, I always say being in business is like sailing. You're never actually pointed at your destination. You're tacking back and forward based on the conditions you experience. And so, so it's really important that you have, and that, this is why at the heart of it is safety and hard conversations. Because I've seen some of the biggest, greatest technology companies in the world completely delude themselves because people weren't honest in talking about how things were going. They, they just gave the good oil rather the reality. So you have to confront your reality. It was a startup I chaired where we had a massive drop in engagement and the management team were making excuses. Okay, oh, it was Christmas or new release. I said, guys, this is terrible. This is terrible. You drop, your engagement is terrible. This is a crisis. Don't kid around, don't make excuses. You've got to treat it that way and really make sure you get on it. So being honest in your appraisal of how you are going, which can only happen if you actually do cascade your strategy to action and you have the right measures and milestones associated with that. And all of that is hard work. It's hard work. It's hard work, <laughs> but you've got to do it. So I'm going to go to the final thing that I do that um, hopefully will help you. I believe, so, so just, just touching back on this, safe, hard choices and hard conversations, clarity, line it up and review it. If you do those five things obsessively, you'll have great culture, you'll have great teams, and you'll be, in my view, far more successful than otherwise. One way that I make this really tangible is I rate the performance of the zero leadership team around a few questions. This one is, how do we rate us as a team relative to what's possible with what we have today? So in other words, not if we have more money, more people. With what we have today, how do we rate our performance? I've now asked lots of people in zero and outside zero this question. A good score, it's really interesting. Good businesses with functioning teams will often rate themselves around six, six and a half. The interesting thing then is if you ask the next question, which is what's the one thing we should do to improve our performance, almost always it has nothing to do with the domain. It's always human stuff about getting clearer, better aligned, having the right conversations. It's almost always human stuff. And you know, I, I can't think, look, you've got to obsess about this stuff. So I run the survey with the Zero Leadership Team every four months. And we do it across those questions. And it, it kind of looks like a little bit like this kind of, this is a representation. By the way, actual data, um, names have been changed to protect the innocent. But if you go across, you can see how those teams are performing across those 
key dimensions. And the interesting thing is it's not uniform. It varies depending on the leader and the team and what they're confronting. And by the way, this is a great basis for a conversation about performance. It's not meant to beat people up. Some of your best leaders are going to have some of the worst scores when you're going through a time of change and uncertainty. And in fact, even with the team, the overall question, which I ask, which is the one on the previous slide, we definitely see, um, I've seen how it ebbs and flows depending on the mood of the group, the way the humans are feeling. Our last one, our safety score was really high. But there was a time not that long ago during our strategy journey where we were making choices and prioritisation where people were feeling a little bit uncomfortable and unsafe because their area was up against you know, many other priorities. So as we got through that and we dealt with that, people feel really good about the choices we've made because I involved the whole leadership team in those choices. You know, there are no winners and losers. Zero is the only winner. And the team have trust that in the way I look, at, look to them and support them and what I expect of them is consistent with those choices that we make. So I guess just to wrap then, um, the human element is everything. If we're living in a changing world, it's about humans changing. And so unless you are really focused and obsessive about making it safe for your people, when, fe when fear is a totally acceptable, reasonable human reaction, uh, unless you really confront the tough choices, unless you pursue clarity and alignment with obsession, um, unless you really measure and review and, and look at your teams and teams throughout your organisation and expect them to review their performance and to make sure they're creating conditions much along the lines of what I described. If you can do all that, then I know you'll be successful and you know, in 40 years, you now know everything I know. So thank you very much. <laughs> You're, you're kind of our grown-up pants CEO, so um, thank you for the um, amazing leadership uh, lesson because you make it sound easy. Um, so for people who have recently become CEOs, how do you get good at this stuff when there's all these other things going on? I mean, what happened in your career to help you fine-tune this lens? Yeah, it's, well, it's all stories and experiences. So, you know, in the time I had today, I could talk about um, the experiences that made me see, like the 90 percent experience around purpose. Like, I'd been doing plan. IBM taught me how to do plans, but I didn't really appreciate the importance of purpose till I was in a startup environment where everyone was doing great stuff, but they all said, but why are we here? So that it's, it's experiences like that, but it's also, Going, living through crisis, I, I announced the first ever redundancies in IBM Australia's history. Mm. Um, I lived at Apple through three CEOs and cry our share price was 17 bucks. And quite frankly, the place was out of control um, and uh, didn't really become disciplined operationally until jobs came back. It was like being at university. Uh, and then the dot-com crash. I remember sitting at 90 MSN in front of 100 people looking at me going, what now? You know, like dot-com crash, no online ads. And, and by the way, also operating in a market where all the experts said banners don't work. The experts said it wouldn't work. So, so I think getting through those, those changes, experiencing those changes um, does give you a, like a sense of calm, but also a sense of what do you tackle. And let's go back to when you were running Apple um, for Asia Pacific. So that 75% cut and product SKUs. Um, what I think I heard then was it wasn't really about having less products to make, it was about having less things to focus on. Was it actually a, yeah. a, a, a kind of a, a, what was it part of that clarity? Yeah, look, it was, was it part of that clarity it conversation. Was, it was a really fascinating this? time because, um, so, <laughs> It was really about getting focus on saving the Macintosh, which is the core product. Um, Michael Spindler, who was the CEO two before Jobs, believed that for Apple to succeed, it had to beat Microsoft and Intel. In fact, the last time I saw him in Cupertino, 
he looked up at me from his desk and said, Microsoft and Intel have effed up this industry. And that's when I knew he was, like, he was gone. It wasn't long after that before he was replaced by Gil Emilio, who became the turnaround guy, or he, he was the turnaround guy. He, he turned around a company called National Semiconductor. He came in, first meeting he had with us, you know, he said, look, I'm a turnaround guy, I'm going to turn Apple around. By the way, the guy's going to write the book. He's back in the back of the room, which, you know, for an Aussie, you go, oh, this is a bit scary. You know, like, he's already writing the book and nothing's happened yet. But, um, uh, you know, and he didn't last very long, but he did bring Jobs and Wozniak back as, as advisors and from there, you know, history's shown. But I think ultimately it was really about getting, getting focus on a few important things to save the company because Spindler had taken it into Windows monitors and printers and so cutting 75% was, was, was big, but the truth was that apart from the Newton, which was a bit uncomfortable, a lot of it made just common sense. It was common sense. It was about getting back to, micro, to, sorry, to Apple's purpose of being different. And presumably that concept of alignment, you need it between your leadership team as well. So how have you gone about building your leadership team? What do you look for yeah. uh, with, within, you know, what's a, what's a, yeah. how, how do you think about that? Well, it's really interesting because it's a kind of an iteration of people and in a sense um, process or the things you need to get done. And so what happens is you start on the journey, you start to work on, well, where do we need to go? And you start to see who on the team may not be oriented that way. And I think you always do it based on their ability or their suitability for the role. So, you know, I'm really fortunate now to have uh, a chief technology officer in Mark Rees who I understand, like, you know, <laughs> and who makes the complex simple for us when it comes to the choices we have to make. Um, you know, I've got a great product leader now as well in, in Anna Curzon. And so it's, it's, it's about evolving the team to meet what the business needs, but also appreciating that not everyone is going to cut it. Actually, I, I, my rule of thumb is if you're going to change strategy, generally speaking, a third of the people who work for you are going to go, right? Now, depending on, you know, if, if it's a significant change of strategy, right? If it's a tweak, maybe not. But but then, if it's a really big change, it could be more. And you have to be open to that, but you have to let, in a sense, be patient, respectful, and let the journey of what you need to get done define who fits and who doesn't. And by the way, what happens with a team over time is the team starts to identify. Mm. So I, as CEO, because I do encourage uh, all my team to speak openly with me, I say, hey, you, you, know, you need to know that Fred's not quite cutting it, okay? And, and then I try and help Fred, uh, but ultimately you do have to make those calls and, and get the right people in the right roles. Because ultimately without the right people in the right roles, you're stuffed. And right? you so, so you need to be clear about what you've got to get done, but you also need the right people there to do it. And so it is an iteration in those early stages until you get your team where you want your team. And avoiding, avoiding the people that don't fit is, is, is a terrible thing to do because your other people know that. And so it's a real poor reflection on you if you don't step up and deal with those things. So that, that third is an example. Um, is that because they're resistant to change or is that because they don't have the skill set or the mindset? Yeah, it can be, it can be both. I mean, um, you know, the, the roles, you know, when you're growing as fast as we are as well, one of our risks is we outgrow people in the organisation. Um, actually, Emily, our head of design, just up the back. So Emily's a really senior design lead for Zero, that now gives us confidence that we've got the discipline or the foundation to build. There's no point in me trying to build the organisation design without the design lead that's going to take us there. So up, upskilling has been a big part. Like it went back to, actually, if you go through that list of six things, almost every one of them I'd say, yes, we're doing it. We've got a work to do. You know that we've got to get our data where we want it, and um, similarly those other other elements. And that concept of safety. So, zeros in a high growth, uh, probably high change uh, environment internally and externally. How do you keep it safe when you have to make changes in teams, make changes in strategy? Um, yeah. Is that kind of the dance? Is that where a lot of the, is that why it's number one? Because yeah. you have to be reinforcing 
Yeah, you have to look, you have to communicate um, and communicate and communicate and really make sure people are heard. So you can't, if you avoid the consequences of those actions rather than get ahead of them, uh, you're really, really putting yourself at risk. So look, we, we've, um, I'll give you some examples of some of this. So we have to prioritise markets. So what do you say to the people in a market that's not prioritised? And what you say to them is, we are adjusting our expectations for you, given what you've got today. Do the best you can with that. Zero overall is going to be better off for that focus we're bringing. Um, and therefore, you'll also be better off. It's not a sign you're not important to us. It's just a sign that we can't do everything for everyone. So it's just, you know, I, I believe there is a nice way to say the harshest things. You just have to take the time to think about how to say those things. And, um, you know, for everything, there's, there's a nice way to say the most harsh things. You know, if someone's not doing a good job, now I can remember on <laughs> stories, St. Ives Liquor Land, I'm on the driveway selling liquor. And um, the, the boss asked me to mop a floor. And so I started mopping the floor. His name was Joe Pritchard. I think he, he might have been 50 back then, but to me, he looked like he was 100. <laughs> and, and so I'm mopping away and Joe comes up, taps me on the shoulder and goes, Steve-o. And so I turn around, I look at Joe, and he's a bit taller than me, old bloke. He goes, Steve-o, you're a good guy. You don't know how to mop a floor. Let me show you how. And he took the mop, mopped away, and said, go back. And he said, away you go, son. And so, you know, and then business I lost, you know, managing director of IBM, I ring him to say, I just blew this deal. He goes, Steve, I'm really sorry to hear it. I hope you learn from this. You know, those reactions to bad situations, you know, framed my thinking about what it means to be respectful and safe. And, but at the same time to tell, you know, tell people what you need to tell them. And who, who do you work in and who does Zero serve? Do you work in the best interest of your shareholders and the best interest of the company or in the best interest of your uh, customers? Because your mission is about making them better. Yeah. Uh, and, look, and do you have that conversation or is that an outdated idea? Look, I, no, look, I think, um, you know, I was really annoyed when I saw the stuff come out of the US from the US Business Council about we've now decided the purpose of business is long, no longer just profit. And they, I, I, I was offended in a sense because I worked for great American companies where that was not the case, right? Yeah. Wall Street certainly played a part, but I never heard Bill Gates or Steve Ballmer ever talk about the Microsoft share price. I, it, it, what will be, will be. And they were commercially driven in different ways. But for me, it's, it's obvious that there's no, there's, if you read a book by Werbach called Strategy for Sustainability, it's a really, it changed my mindset because I realised there is no conflict between building a sustainable business and a successful business. It might in the short term cause you trouble, but that's only because you're misaligned with the future anyway. So you better jump on it. And so for me, it's about great, creating a great culture. We talk about inside out, making sure that zero is on the inside. What is it we want everyone who, who we touch to feel in connecting with us? And we want to promote that. I mean hashtag human and hashtag beautiful around what we do and the customer experiences we want to create are important. So starting internally, caring about our customers and partners, and then you know whatever happens with investors and the share market happens. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time, you know, it's just, there's no, no, there's no value in me focusing on that. It's got to be on the substance of what we are and what we create. So accountants and bookkeepers, small businesses, they're our obsession. Um, but we collectively have to be on the same page culturally and in terms of what we're trying to do to serve them best. Okay. Didn't answer the question. What was the question? Who do you work in the best interest of? Your customers, your oh, shareholders? Look, uh, it's, got to be, it's got to be, in a sense, if you don't have happy employees aligned and executing, well, your customers don't get served. If your customers yeah. don't get served, yeah, so I, I would definitely say... So it's almost say, a redundant question now because it's yeah. such a symbiosis between... It's, it's inside out. It's got to be inside out because you can't be on the outside what you're not on the inside anymore. Yeah. Maybe in the old days you used to be able to, but now it is about, you know, what I see, create a safe environment where people can do the best work of their lives and then our customers benefit and then our shareholders benefit. And final question about building an international team from Australia. Now the head office mo has moved to Australia. Oh, Wellington, mate. Oh, okay. Wellington, sorry. Wellington. We are okay, proudly sorry. Kiwi company. Okay, sorry. Um, so, nice no, important. It's yeah, important. yeah, it is. 
Um, I thought when it moved to ASX. No, we ASX listed, and I know there was a little bit of, you know, was it underside of the leaf that came through when we did that? Yeah. Um, and the truth was, should be proud. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, it okay, should be proud. Okay, so, so the great. head office is still here. Um, when you were building overseas teams to win in the US, um, versus to, well, what's another market which is a UK? Critical? Okay, UK, yeah. right? Yeah. Totally different. How do you think about diversity and, and, and ethnicity? Do you fill it with Americans? Do you fill it with Brits? Do you mix it up? Do you try and make Wellington the melting pot? How, how do you build international teams to win from New Zealand? Look, you have to have great locals running your business around the world, ultimately. When you're new and you're starting out, and the big US tech companies did the same, you do send people who know your business offshore to go and help in those markets. Uh, but at the end of the day, the quality of your hiring of leaders in those international markets defines you, it defines your success, defines your failure. So, um, you know, you, you've really got to make those hiring decisions with a great deal of care and make sure those people are really supported. We're an interesting company and unlike some, we were very regionalised. So our regions of the world operate independently. It's only in the last six to 12 months we're implementing global sales and marketing functions, which is kind of, I call it US Tech Multinational 101, in that you've got to, you've got to have global strength process with local execution and leadership. So we're doing those two things. So we were fortunate in many ways, you know, with Chris in, uh, Chris Reid and then Trent, who now runs our Australian business and has for seven years. Um, Gary in the UK, you know, we're very fortunate with those leaders because they were culturally aligned and uh, did a great job. In the Americas, we, we've been on a bit of a journey and that's more a function, I think, of our strategy and what we expect, expectation than the people we hire. We hired some good people, but not necessarily for the right set of objectives, so. But ultimately great locals supported by a very strong Absolutely. Yep. strategy and culture yeah. out of the, the New Zealand based I mean, business. And you know, US companies um, in the tech space have done a wonderful job of creating truly um, multinational, multicultural organi organizations where you meet people of completely different cultures but you have the same values because mm. they rep they're represented much more by the organization for what it wants to accomplish. Oh, it's a remarkable company. It was a fantastic yeah. talk. Thank Thanks you for having so me, much. Jeremy. Appreciate it. Thank you.